just not the little thing anymore, right? It changes every time. All right, here they come. I got the little thing. Welcome to another evening of Northshire Live. I'm Daveth Wood. I'm the events manager from Northshire's Manchester, Vermont location. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see you all here. A few quick notes before we get started uh, as you're getting settled. Um, we are recording tonight's event. Um, so, um, but, and, lo lo and then loading it up onto our YouTube channel later on for perpetuity. But don't worry, uh, only those who are unmuted and speaking in this nice little yellow box will be recorded tonight. Um, likewise, uh, because we're muted, please type any questions you have for our authors in the chat box. Now, uh, I have been really looking forward to tonight's event um, with Philip Denieri for his new book, The Appalachian Trail, A Biography. Uh, Philip teaches courses on the built environment at the University of Michigan. He worked in public radio journalism and state government before earning a PhD in urban and regional planning in Michigan. He lives in Ann Arbor. His new book, The Appalachian Trail, a biography, has been called the superbly rendered incisive take on an American treasure that shines with illuminating detail and insight. Uh, let me throw the link up so that you can buy it if you have it already. Um, and likewise, our good friend Bill McKibben said that for those of us who live with wild places in the American East, the Appalachian Trail is more than a line on a map, as this book makes clear. It's the jagged, it's jagged path is the EKG of our heart's desires. We are very lucky also to be joined by Randy Minotaur, an author and journalist who has written more than 80 published books, including regional bestsellers, Death in Acadia, and Birding New England, uh, which I had the pleasure of hosting her and her husband photographer, Nick, for in our Manchester store in the before times. One of her latest is Off the Beaten Path, New York, which you can find at the link that I've also put in the chat. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Randy Minotaur and Philip Danieri. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, David. And I, I want to jump right in here because I, I got to tell you, I, I read Philip's book and I just loved it because I have dreamed of hiking the, the entire Appalachian Trail since I was in my 30s, which believe me was a long time ago. So this is something I, I have thought about uh, for a great deal. So Philip, why does the Appalachian Trail capture the imagination of so much of the American public, including people like me? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, the Appalachian Trail in some respects is just a trail. So what attracts us to it is what attracts us to any trail. It is this idea that we can separate from the routine world and put ourselves in a place where you've really only got two directions, forward and back, and you've got trees or some sort of scenery around you. It's the, it's the idea of, of the escape and, and finding, uh, you know, sort of a different world out there. What obviously makes the AT unique, there are a few things, but the most obvious thing is that it's 2,100 miles long. So when you're on the trail and, and like the vast majority of users of the trail, I've, I have not done no long distance hikes on it. I've done several short hikes uh, in, in fact, in each of the 14 states that the trail goes through. But when you're on it, the idea that this thing goes and goes and goes in, in a practically endless way, of course it does have endpoints and some people, you know, try to tackle it by, by hiking the whole thing. But on a, on a moment to moment basis, it, it has this endless quality to it. Um, so it's in some respects, it's a trail like any other, but because it's so, so long um, and has this endless quality to it, um, I think that's what really brings, brings people to it. The, the other thing I would mention is the trail was intentionally built. The rationale behind it was that it was so close to the major population seaboards of the Eastern seaboard. That's not a fluke. That's, that was a, a big part of why it was built. So it has this attraction to us because we might be from New York or Boston or Philadelphia or Washington or Atlanta or any number of places. And here's this portal into a very natural environment that's not that far away. It's pretty easy to get to. In most places, it's pretty easy, you know, very accessible to do a short hike on. Um, so you, com you combine those things. A lot of people nearby seeking that escape, this sort of endless quality to it. Um, and uh, it, it, 
certainly has captured my imagination for a long time. Yeah, I can I can totally understand that. And you know, one of the things that struck me uh, in reading the book was you you talked about the uh, the the days when the Appalachian Trail was was still you know mostly in people's imagination, and uh, th at that time uh, the United States had become very suddenly urbanized because of the Industrial Revolution and so on. Yeah, so in particular in the role of Horace Kephart's life, one of the, one of the biographies that you, that you tell in this book. Uh, how do you, the, you, you talk about the back to nature desire. Uh, how do you see that connecting even in today's society, especially in this la these last 15 months during the pandemic? Yeah, there have been a lot of different back to nature movements uh, in you know sort of Western society uh, uh, ever since the late 1800s. It's a, it's a direct outgrowth of it's a it's the flip side of industrialization and the creation of a, of a modern economy. So prior to roughly the mid to late 1800s, the woods, the mountains, what we now call the wilderness were not seen as a refuge or anything like that. It was a dark, mysterious, physically and in the viewpoints of the times, morally dangerous place. Um, it was, you know, civilization was in the farms and in the towns and in the cities. And the farther you got away from that, the more problematic it was, um, which is why the mountains really weren't even mapped until the late 1800s, the Appalachian Mountains. Mm -hmm. As soon as we got comfortable, as soon as a middle class got comfortable in its urban and suburban livelihoods, first around the late 1800s and, and, and ever more so going in future years, this idea of um, a, a nostalgic uh, retreat from the complicated civilized world, a back to nature that would somehow make us, um, you know, better, more authentic, healthier, um, that, you know, began to emerge. So Horace Kephart wrote in the 1920s, he was a very popular writer. He lived on the eastern flank of the Great Smoky Mountains in North Carolina and wrote from there a wildly popular author who, who crafted this story of what it meant to go back to nature. Um, his version of back to nature was it really only counted and you were really only legitimate if you were chopping down trees to make your shelter, if you were fishing, if you were hunting, that was one version of back to nature. 180 degrees from contemporary back to nature, which is about, of course, leave no trace. You know, right. go and you know, don't don't take anything, don't don't leave anything. Um, there was a 1960s version of back to nature, and definitely we are seeing nowadays a huge rush to the out of doors as we've all been cooped up for 15 months. Uh, uh, there's this uh, idea of reconnecting with, frankly, a world that's larger than ourselves. And if you live on the internet and you're checking your news all the time and you've got all of these electronic impulses into your brain, the idea of connecting to something more timeless, much bigger than our workaday concerns, uh, I think we've got that urge as much as we ever have, but it's definitely not a new thing. It goes back, as I said, at least to the late 1800s. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, how, how did you choose the people that you, let, well, let me say, you know, the, this book is a series of biographies of the people who were the most important to the development of the trail. Uh, how did you choose which ones to profile? Um, let me let me read you a quick blurb from the beginning of the book and um, that kind of sets that up and then I could talk about the individuals themselves. Um, by way of background, I, I, I opened the book with an anecdote about hiking on Mount Greylock in, in Massachusetts, um, a, a hike that didn't go well. I won't spoil that for you. Um, so after telling that story, I, I say this. Uh, Every year, the Appalachian Trail hosts hundreds of thousands of people seeking some kind of connection to nature without abandoning their civilized selves. The vast majority of these visitors are, as I was on Greylock, out for an hour or a half day with a parking lot as the start and end point. For a much smaller group, multi-day backpacking trips might cover the trail's extent in one national park or one state. 
and a tiny percentage of Appalachian Trail users hike the entire thing in one trip, a month long rite of passage. But even the hardest core through hikers maintain ties to the wider world. They use lightweight, durable gear made of materials Henry David Thoreau could not have imagined, maintain precise locational awareness with sophisticated GPS, and take advantage of infrastructure in town and on the trail provided by the society around them. To be perfectly clear, the person who nearly passed out trekking up Mount Greylock of all places is not questioning the fortitude of those rare few who navigate months of mental and physical hardship to through hike the Appalachian Trail. The point is that even a journey of that scale and ambition is not a total separation from the modern world. It is one instance of something more universal in our retreats into nature, a productive tension between shelter and escape, freedom and abandonment. Any place that aspires to provide such a retreat, a park, a recreational area, a 2100 mile long trail over the Appalachian Mountains will reflect this tension. The places we choose and the way we then develop and manage them tell us a lot about what we are asking from nature, what exactly we think we are traveling toward and escaping from, where we want to strike the balance between maddening civilization on the one hand and heartless nature on the other. Telling the story of the Appalachian Trail then means telling a story of people. In each of the chapters that follow, I have tried to capture an important piece of the trail's history by profiling an individual or two or three whose own life made an important intersection with the development of the AT. My hope is that to the extent we can understand these individuals in the context of their own lives, their personalities, their successes and failures, the cultures they were a part of, we can gain some insight into the very human process of crafting a natural environment around ourselves. So if that was the task I set out, um, then the way that it made sense to do that in my mind was to track these people you know, on their own terms uh, in, their, in their individual lives. How did I pick the ones to, to pay attention to? A few of them were um, unavoidable. Um, and that's, a, I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way, but you cannot tell the story of the Appalachian Trail without telling the story of Benton Mackay, uh, who wrote the proposal to, to have the thing built, or Myron Avery, who succeeded Mackay in a way that Mackay was not very comfortable with and actually browbeat a whole bunch of people into getting the darn thing built. So some of those were, I think, givens. Other people like Horace Kephart, this writer in the 19 teens and 20s, or James P. Taylor, who led the construction of the Long Trail in Vermont, um, they were folks who had interesting life stories and who conveniently their lives covered an era that allowed me to accumulate this story of the trail. So if the structure of the book works, <laughs> then what's happening is as you, reach e as you read each of these individual biographies, you're getting a life story, but you're also getting a segment of the trail's history that stacks up sequentially through time. So it was a combination of who had an interesting story to tell and, and through whom could I tell these important parts of, of, of the story. Great. And well, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad you mentioned James Taylor, uh, because of course, you know, locally in Vermont, he is the one that the, the name that people will know uh, because he, he championed building the Long Trail. It seems like such a wonderful project to build a trail that's going to follow the ridgeline of the Green Mountains, but he met with all kinds of resistance from the local mountain clubs. Can you talk about some of that? Yeah, it was, it, these are always tricky projects, you can imagine. There's different folks who have different visions of what the outdoors are for and what the mountains are for. So when James P. Taylor, he was an, he was an outsider to Vermont, as I understand so many Vermonters are, um, but he had, he had moved into the state to take a teaching job in Saxton's River at Vermont Academy and almost overnight said, hey, Vermont, I know what you all need. You need a trail that runs the length of the Green Mountains. You need a Green Mountain Club that will not only build the trail, but will organize local clubs into a, a sort of confederation. There will be connections into the towns. We're gonna take this stretch of the state, which has been viewed more or less as wasteland because it had never been able to be farmed. And we're gonna turn it into that thing that defines our state. 
and he was a, 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 a booster. He was an organizer. He was somebody who got very excited about these ideas that he had. It was an interesting combination of, of uh, you know, enthusiasm for the outdoors, but also civic boosterism, two things that don't always go hand in hand. He did get a lot of buy-in on the initial project. In fact, at first, the folks that he couldn't get buy-in from were the snooty Boston Appalachian Mountain Club members who said, oh, we only go hiking in the, in the craggy white mountains. Um, you, you can do the green mountains on your own. That didn't last for too long. And by the way, to all the AMC members in the room, I'm of course uh, speaking facetiously. Uh, but back then that was the, the tenor of the conversation, at least from Taylor's perspective. So you had these outdoors people who said, well, is this really worth doing? Are we overdeveloping the mountains if we do this and taking away from the natural escape that it provides? But then you also had people saying, well, this sounds like a frivolous thing to do. Um, so ultimately, Taylor's enthusiasm and his, the, 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 the fact that people could latch onto this idea was what got it built. And then that provided the prototype for the process of, of building support for and then building the Appalachian Trail. There's something incredibly unifying that people can immediately wrap their heads around of, we're gonna take this line that runs over the highest land and we're gonna put a trail on it. And it turns out that, that the simplicity of that concept you know, really pulls a lot of folks together. Um, towards the end of the second half of his career, Taylor's boosterism got a little bit ahead of where Vermonters were willing to go, um, which is another story that I tell in there. But, um, but fundamentally, I think it's a successful story. He did something in Vermont that was a crucial part of building a New England trail network, which was the indispensable anchor on which the larger Appalachian Trail project happened. Which, of course, brings us fairly naturally to talking about Myron Avery, you know, in, and I've had the pleasure of writing about the AT in several of my books, and uh, it's always Benton Mackay, Benton Mackay, you know, everybody sings the praises of Benton Mackay, and then later the, the people, who, the first people who threw hike the trail. But I never had heard of Myron Avery, and I and that that's just a, a, a terrible oversight on my part, not to have uh, heard of the man who actually got the thing built. Tell us about Mr. Avery. Avery is uh, like most of the people in this book. He's he's quite a character. Um, the short version of the story is he was. Uh, a young man, a Washington attorney, very enthusiastic about the prospect of an Appalachian Trail, so enthusiastic that he organized and led the effort to mark the trail, determine where it would go, get clubs organized that would clear the trail. He was, uh, you know, an energizer bunny. Um, a little bit about his, his background. Uh, so so he, he was so enthusiastic about building the trail for its own sake that excuse me, the ideals that Benton Mackay had baked into the Appalachian Trail project really got set aside. Mackay was after some, some bigger things with creating a realm in the backwoods that people could get to. And Mackay said, yeah, 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 yeah. Can we cut out the philosophy and just build the darn thing? Um, he was uh, born and raised in Maine. He went to Harvard Law School. He became uh, an attorney for the federal government in Washington, DC. And I think the term we would now use to describe Avery is compulsive. Um, he, he worked countless hours and, and burned bridges with hundreds of people who he wore out with his demands and his argumentativeness. Um, he was really sort of the, the field general and, um, you know, the, the master builder, the uh, not quite finding the right word um, uh, to get this thing done. So on the one hand, he's a hero of the AT project in that if you hadn't had his energy and direction, uh, I, I don't think it would have been completed before World War II. Um, and it was, I think you could argue that only because it was completed before World War II was it substantial enough that after it pretty much fell apart during the war, it could be rebuilt in the post-war period. Um, so what I argue in the book is you really can't imagine the AT being built 
without there having been a Benton Mackay and without there having been a Myron Avery. If there had just been Mackay, there probably would have been too much philosophizing and not enough trail building. I bet that makes a lot of sense. And sometimes you need the people who, who are just going to pick up the tools and get the job done. And by the way, you might be able to tell, I would never criticize somebody for too much philosophizing. I'm a big <laughs> fan of Ben McCaw, but uh, um, anyways. No, but, but nonetheless. Uh, and meanwhile, at the same time that the trail itself was coming to fruition, the National Park Service got it into its head to build roads right along the same the same routes. In fact, at one point, just you know, running the Blue Ridge Parkway right over the AT. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about what what that you know what that was like for Avery in particular, and and how how we overcame that? Yeah. Well, what happened was um, the first part of the story is cars made the construction and the use of these trails possible. So when Myron Avery led these work crews from Washington up into uh, the Shenandoah uh, ridgeline to clear trail, they were carpooling. Back then, maybe one person had a car, maybe two would take, you know, two cars would take eight or 10 people out. Cars got people out there to build the trails, and then cars took people out there to hike. There's no understanding the, the, um, the, growing popularity of hiking, camping, and the backwoods without cars being a part of the equation. What happened was, after cars did that, as more and more people got cars, well, now there was an audience and there was a demand for, I want to go to these mountains and I want to be able to experience it by driving down a parkway. So the National Park Service, which has built into its mission providing access to these gorgeous natural spaces to people. And oh, by the way, building a political constituency for the protection of these spaces, the Park Service said a, a great way to make them available to people is to build these parkways. Um, now, a parkway is both a road and a park. It's a protected corridor. It has very few connection points or ramps to other places. It's designed to be driven down to provide access to scenery, but it is still a road. And in the case of Shenandoah National Park, they said, we're gonna build this gorgeous skyline drive. And by the way, it is gorgeous. If you yeah. get the chance, take a drive on it. Yep. But we're gonna build it over the same Shenandoah Ridge line that the AT was just opened up on. Um, some people in the AT community said, we've got to organize and fight the National Park Service on this, including Benton Mackay, who came up with the whole idea for the AT. Myron Avery said, no, y'all, the Park Service is our partner. There wouldn't be a Shenandoah National Park for us to run this trail through if we didn't have them as a partner. So let's keep it the political heat low. Let's work out some case by case solutions. Um, in the end, the Park Service not only built Skyline Drive through Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, but it built the Blue Ridge Parkway to go hundreds of miles connecting Shenandoah National Park to Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina and Tennessee, which re required after World War II a relocation of the AT inland by you know, dozens of miles, an entirely new route for it. Um, similarly, in Vermont, the Park Service said, hey, we could protect a 10 mile wide corridor of the Green Mountain Ridge Line if Vermont would join with us in building a parkway. And Vermont didn't get that. It didn't get a national park protecting the Green Mountains Ridge Line. It got a lot of mountaintop development, but it also didn't get a road running down, you know, the tops of all these mountains. It has the long trail and the AT doing it. So it's a, it's obviously a complicated story. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, today, there are lots of things that help through hikers when they, the people who actually try to hike this thing end to end. Uh, there are shelters, there's access to towns for supplies and so on. But back when Earl Schaefer did this himself and became the first person to through hike the trail. There was none of that. What, what was it like back then when he hiked the AT? Um, 
there wasn't even a trail in many places for Earl Schaefer to hike the Appalachian Trail. Um, he, he hiked the trail as best he could from Georgia to Maine in the summer of 1948. Because the trail had fallen apart due to overgrowth and a whole variety of other things during the war years, and the fact that this parkway was being built and it had to be relocated, it really wasn't a fully contiguous trail again until 1951. So when he, so he knew that this thing had been completed before he went away to serve in World War II um, and had it as an idea to hike it when he got back. Um, so he did so with surplus army gear a lot heavier than anything anybody would carry around today. Um, he you know, wore through a bunch of, of leather boots. Now we would have super lightweight fabric in those boots. Um, you know, a, a backpack held together, not with ultralight plastics or carbon fiber, but with metal tubing. Um, so he, he really pioneered this idea of setting the full AT as your goal and doing it, doing the whole thing in one season. Um, and there was a lot of hardship associated with that, but overcoming that hardship, finding the trail, putting up with the weather, dealing with the heaviness of the gear really became then a part of what it means to through hike. And so his through hike in 48, um, the details of, of who exactly did what hike first, uh, you can imagine there are, you know, there are communities that organize around this. It's not a, a debate that I really care to get into very much, but there's no question that Schaefer's is the, the story of through hiking that begins the, 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 the history that everybody wants to connect to. And it was a very you know, difficult undertaking. There's now definitely much more infrastructure for hikers. There's shelters on the trail. There are trail towns, for example, Bennington, Vermont, just named the most recently named official AT community, where communities welcome hikers into town. There are hiker hostels to stay in. There are places to get supplies. Um, and that's to say nothing of the, of the digital tech that people are hiking with nowadays. Right. So there's no question that it's a different thing now. There's a lot more support for it than it was in Earl Schaefer's time. Um, but nevertheless, especially if you're talking about a 2000 mile hike, there's no question it's still an ordeal. Uh, it still requires, you know, a, a lot of overcoming of hardship, just like it did for, for Schaefer. Sure. And then there was Emma Gatewood. And she was not the first woman to through hike the Appalachian Trail, but she's probably the most famous from, from the early days. Why did she become so famous? Well, because her story was... Um, so easily captured, it so easily captured people's imaginations. Um, so this is just a few years after Earl Schaefer, this fit, uh, you know, young man in his 20s does the, does the AT. Uh, Emma Gatewood, when she threw hiked, was 67 years old. She was the mother of 11 and the, ground, the grandmother of more than 20. Um, and unlike Earl Schaefer, or maybe the conventional AT story, I'm going to find the right gear, I'm going to be an outdoor survivalist, and I'm going to set myself upon this challenge. Uh, Emma Gatewood said, I've led a really difficult, hard life. Um, there's some details on that in the book. There's a full book called Grandma Gatewood's Walk. The gist of it is that she was violently and repeatedly abused for years in her marriage. Um, by the time she was 67, her kids were grown. She was out of this marriage. She said, she didn't say much about why she hiked, but the tone of it was, I just like walking. I just want to go out and walk in nature. It wasn't about the pilgrimage or, you know, the story that you could tell as it was for Schaefer, nor was it about necessarily staying completely separated from the world around her. She had grown up in the Appalachian foothills on the Ohio side of the Ohio River, right across from West Virginia. She was used to walking in the countryside, you know, giving and accepting help from strangers. And that was the way that she hiked the AT. Um, so as she was doing this and the, the rangers in the national forest that she passed through got word of what she was up to, word started to to spread a little bit and a local newspaper reporter would come out and do a local story and then eventually it got picked up on the, the news wires. She gained her most fame because uh, uh, the only 
woman reporter for the then new magazine Sports Illustrated caught on to her story um, and, and caught up with, with Emma Gatewood and told Gatewood's story from the perspective of an athletic accomplishment as opposed to who's this kooky old lady walking down the trail. Um, and, and the two of them even became sort of friends for a while. Uh, so when Emma Gatewood finished her hike, she wound up going on the Today Show, you know, people paying a lot of attention to her. She then did other through hikes. She wound up walking the, the route of the Oregon Trail across the Western US. Um, so anyways, a, a very interesting story. Wow, absolutely. Uh, your, the last biography in the book, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead now, so uh, is uh, of Bill Bryson, the author of A Walk in the Woods, who kind of put the Appalachian Trail into the, the general public consciousness. What, I'm gonna ask a fangirl question here. How hard was it to get the interview with Bill Bryson? Um, to, to me, to his credit, it was not that hard. Um, uh, it surprised me how gracious he was. Um, I mean, Bill Bryson is obviously a best-selling author and well-known to people who go to bookstores here in the U.S. In the U.K., he's an even bigger celebrity. He's, he's a, a public intellectual. I'm not sure who the counterpart would be in America, but he's not just a best-selling author. The closest I could come, and this is an imperfect analogy, is maybe Ken Burns, where just to say the word Ken Burns, immediately people start thinking, the Civil War and those documentaries. And it's it's a whole, pardon my usage of this term, it's a, it's a whole brand. It's a whole sort of subset of, of the media. And that's what Bryson is in the UK. Um, so I emailed him and I told him about what I was working on. And it took a few emails going back and forth, but he said, you know, I'll be in the US. Um, I've got some free time here. You could meet up with me. And uh, and you know, he said he did say this is all I can give you. We'll have this one block of time. Use as much of the time as you want to, but that'll have to be it. But the thing that he said was so. I interviewed him in um, the fall of uh, 2019. He was on tour for his last book. Then he has now. He was sort of trying out retirement. He's now publicly announced that he's retired. He's not going to write more books. He's not going to do more bookstore events. But you know, he's been a writer for a long time. Before he wrote books, he wrote magazine articles where he had to profile prominent people just like he became. And I honestly think, well, he, he said as much. He said, you know, his writing has relied enough on people agreeing to interviews that he, I think, felt some obligation to. What to me made it, I thought, an especially gracious thing to do is he wasn't, a, his talking to me was not a part of the publicity around a book coming out. A Walk in the Woods came out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he really did it just to be a nice person. Um, and he was very forthcoming in the interview. So he, um, you know, we chatted for maybe two hours. Uh, he was, you know, um, I, I couldn't have asked for anything more from him. Oh, that is wonderful. That's very, very good to, to hear about somebody I have such respect for. Uh, but Bill Bryson did the unthinkable. He approached the Appalachian Trail, not with the reverence that most of us show for it, but with a sense of humor. Um, I remember his book opens with talking about the possibility of running into a bear. Um, how was his book received by the Appalachian Trail community? Yeah, you, you put it well um, that he, in some respects, did the unthinkable. Within the Appalachian Trail community, understandably, um, it's not something to be joked about. The trail itself is magnificent. Mm -hmm. the, the project that put it there was big and ambitious and it took a lot of years to, to, to make it happen. Uh, the work that it takes to make the Appalachian Trail the Appalachian Trail is considerable and it is done to this day by volunteers up and down the trail organized into local clubs. And lastly, if you've through hiked or you've sectioned hike or, you, or you've, you've had an important experience on the trail, it's this, it's this place through which we access the majesty of nature. And here comes Bill Bryson cracking jokes, making fun of himself, making fun of other hikers, um, treating the trail as a, a, a sort of um, 
piece of pop culture. And that didn't go over terribly well in the AT community. Not, I wouldn't say that he was, you know, sort of universally condemned for it, but definitely the folks who, you know, wrote into the AT publication about Bryson's book, you know, said he's being disrespectful, he's being cavalier. He did, um, I, I think, um, probably, I am, I'm guessing here that even he himself regrets some of the stereotypes of Southern Appalachians that he used in the book. Um, but to me, the importance of the book is that you knew that the Appalachian Trail was a part of the American, not just physical landscape, but cultural landscape when it could play the role that it did in that book. It was just a huge bestseller. Um, and the AT of 20 or 30 years earlier wouldn't have been able to be. So I think that to the degree people were uncomfortable with Bryson's book from within the trail community, I suspect that one of the things going on there was that in some respects, the secret was out. And this thing that had been a wonderful project within a smaller, perhaps somewhat insular community now belonged to all of us who might want to buy the book. Um, uh, and you know, um, and so that 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 too was a part of the of the trail's history that you can understand. It might it may have been a good thing. It means that the trail was successful, but how that could also be a little bit troublesome for some folks. Sure, you know that that makes a lot of sense. The people I've I've met who have been on the trail or who have through hiked the trail certainly have have made that uh, made it, it clear how they felt about, about his book. So. Uh, Finally, is there is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to make sure people know about this book and about your experience of writing it? Um, it, not really. I mean, you've asked some, some wonderful questions, and I, so so thank you. Um, uh, I guess a couple of things I mentioned. You know, I said at the start, uh, I'm not a veteran hiker. Far from it. Um, I. I spent more time in library archives and thumbing through dusty papers than I did on the trail in writing this book. Um, uh, so folks should know that going into it. Um, the, the only other thing that I, although I will say the neat thing about this is that uh, you know, when I was researching James P. Taylor, he had uh, grown up in, uh, at Colgate University in upstate, in central New York and taught there for a while. His papers were there in Hamilton, New York. I then wanted to research him uh, in, the, in the state archives. Um, on the way, halfway between, spent the night in Bennington and hiked Stratton Mountain the next morning. Um, and that played out time and again. I'm in Maine researching Myron Avery and I can hike the trail there. I'm in North Carolina researching Horace Kep Kephart and I can hike the trail there. So it was neat how the archival research lined up with getting out for these hikes that at least gave me a feel for what the trail can look like in all of the different places that it is. And it is a very different trail with very different surroundings in these different states uh, that it runs through. Um, I guess the only other thing I would mention is that the trail today is protected by uh, the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, the state parks that it runs through, but the National Park Service is the lead agency, and we only now have a permanently protected trail corridor because the federal government um, committed the money and the power of the federal government to create a corridor for it. So whereas it grew up in the 1930s and 40s with a series of sort of one-off handshake agreements, maybe we can run it here, maybe we can run it there, it now has this much more permanent status of what I refer to as the narrowest national park. Um, and that's the reality of the trail in, in the present tense. Um, Great. So I'll leave it there. Great. Well, well, Phil, this has been fascinating and I'm gonna throw it back to, to David at this point. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, for filling us in about your book. And I, I, let me say again, I love this book because uh, I, love, I love the trail, but the stories behind it are, are just, fascinating and put it in a whole new perspective for me so thanks so much for taking well, thank you years. randy for giving it such a such a such a good reading and i've really enjoyed your questions sure. yes thanks so much randy they were fantastic this has been a great event and please if you have any questions please type them into the chat um phil i've got a question to start things off um what was the most interesting thing you learned in your research that didn't make it into the book 
What was the most interesting thing that didn't make it into the book? Um, <laughs> this isn't quite an answer to that question, but I mentioned how wonderful Bryson was. Um, <laughs> but what we agreed to do was scaled back from what I had hoped to do. So when we first started swapping emails, I kind of had in the back of my head, uh, maybe he would let me visit with him over the course of a couple of days. Maybe he would dig out his notebooks from that he took while he was doing the hike. And I could tell the story that way with some of this behind the scenes knowledge. He, he lives permanently in the UK, although you can imagine he you know, is in the US a fair bit. Um, so the first thing I put out there was, hey, how about if I fly over and I'll you know, go through your old notebooks and write the chapter based on that? And he said, mm, no. <laughs> um, so that was something that I had hoped would be in the book uh, uh, that didn't make it. Um, but there's no, uh, to, to be honest, this is the first book I've written. I imagined that there would, uh, that I wouldn't come up so close to deadline as I did, but I did my work, I wrote my chapters, the deadline was there. And to be honest, I submitted pretty much everything I had. So there's not one, one thing that I thought might happen were, were more um, sidebars. There's a handful of little mini articles within there. One of them is on, um, the so-called three, musket three musketeers, these three, three women who threw hiked the long trail in the 1920s. I had thought I might have some more little, you know, excursions like that, um, that you know, that, that it didn't play out that way. Um, there's a comment here from Sharon. She says, it's interesting to see in this event tonight that there's more women tuned in than men. Are there any other uh, interesting things like that, like the three musketeers that are in interesting sort of on, on gender roles, like the figure you mentioned earlier? Absolutely. Um, it's not, it's not a, a subject matter that I have any expertise in whatsoever, um, but it's very clear that women were a part of the hiking and the trail building community, not just with the Appalachian Trail, but uh, to a great degree and in a way that, that they weren't in other walks of life and um, at that point in time. So, um, you know, we mentioned that Myron Avery did so much to get the trail built, excuse me, in the 1930s and then again in the 1950s. These trail building expeditions that he led would have men and women on them. Um, and the, the huge amount of office work that needed to be done, the letters that had to be written and sent out, the collection of data that was in a sort of traditional gender role situation of that time period done by women you know, who worked in the office. So it was by no means limited to that office work, um, but it's also clear you couldn't have done this if you hadn't had that coordination that those women volunteers had. But you know, it's interesting, James P. Taylor, who, got, who, who founded the Green Mountain Club that built the Long Trail, he was first and foremost a teacher and he believed in the value of the outdoors because he, he only taught boys and he felt like it gave boys an opportunity and a venue to be athletic, but outside the usual constraints of team sports, of baseball and football and competition. It was a different sort of thing. Um, and so my suspicion is that, uh, and it's not just a suspicion, it's, it's informed by you know, what I've been exposed to in doing the research for this book, is that the outdoors and hiking and experiencing nature, it was a place that had much more, much fewer and much more vaguely defined gender roles. And therefore it was much more a space for men and women in the 1930s and 40s when, when so many other things would have had that, that bright line separation. Thanks, that's really interesting. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to this topic and how it relates to your um, scholarly discipline of on studying the built environment? Yeah, it, um, the, the clearest explanation of that is this Benton Mackay guy who invented the Appalachian Trail was himself a regional planner. And so when I was in grad school studying urban planning and we're learning about the history of our field, we come across this guy, Benton Mackay, who wrote some really important seminal articles that are still read today about the relationship between the sprawling metropolitan that's oozing outward and then the natural surroundings and how, how, the, how they set the constraints on 
the urban and the relationship between the built and the place where those resources come from. And so here's this guy who's this urban theorist who led an organization, co-led an organization called the Regional Planning Association of America. And yet he's the same one who said, let's build an Appalachian Trail. Not only did he happen to do both of those things, but they were two sides of the same coin for him. In Mackay's imagination, the trail would host small communities that people would take one or two week visits to and they would live in this rural environment. They would learn backwoods skills. They would see and experience an alternative to their urban lives. And these individual communities would be connected by a walking trail. So that's where the trail came from initially was it would, it would just be the connecting tissue for these alternative communities. But the other thing that was a key part of his vision was that the trail would be the spine for a much larger protected area, thousands of acres on either side of the trail that would form in effect a, a green belt that would run along the ridge line and then would have fingers that would reach down into the valleys and towards the cities and would be what we now as planners would call an urban growth boundary, a place that says, this is for nature, this is for small scale rural development, and the city and the suburbs can't come here. Uh, the highways can't come here. And it would form a boundary on everything else. Um, so you can't have a built environment of cities um, you know, without this complementary natural world. And as I was saying earlier, when I talked about when people started to go to the woods as, as, a, you know, as an escape, in many respects, you can't have natural recreation, an escape to nature, if you don't have something you're escaping from. So the built and the natural shape each other. And, and in my worldview, it's most useful to talk about the interrelationship among them, which is what we as planners and I who teach classes in the built environment, you know, that we think about. So the AT is this wonderfully natural place, but it's also built. You got to cut down the trees. You got to build the shelters. You got to provide the parking lots. You've got to put in anti-erosion measures. So it's built and natural at the same time, and it's that it's that interplay um, that I you know find really interesting and that does fit with my scholarly background. That's interesting. What's your take, uh, not related to the Appalachian Trail, but on those spaces in cities like um, the high rise in New York or High Line in New York, where the natural world is sort of taking over these? Uh, I'd love to hear you sort of talk about those places. Yeah, that's a perfect example. So the High Line is this abandoned elevated road, uh, elevated railway that has now become a linear park, landscaped with native species. Um, uh, its own walking portal into its environment, but the environment is, you know, Manhattan around it. What we're seeing is that old-fashioned distinctions. And when I say old fashioned, I mean the ones that I grew up with. Um, you know, I grew up with an understanding of a sort of black and white, you know, here and there, city and nature and never the twain shall meet. And that, there, that was always, it turns out, if you read the history, an oversimplification, but it's becoming increasingly true nowadays with urban greenways, with places like the High Line, um, with things like urban agriculture, where we're growing our food in these cities. Um, uh, Ann Arbor, where I am, is a part of the Detroit metropolitan area. Detroit is, a, is an underpopulated city with huge tracts of abandoned properties. Some of the best pheasant habitat in the state of Michigan is in the city of Detroit. So the idea that you know, the human spaces and the natural spaces are completely separate. It just doesn't hold up anymore. And what I found is the undergraduates that I'm teaching now, these 20 and 22 year olds, they've grown up in, in this world where they blend together and they think in really creative and interesting ways about these spaces that dispense with some of the old dichotomies that, you know, that I, for one, grew up with. Um, one just little anecdote about that um, I we talked in my class this year about a controversy near the Appalachian Trail in Maine over whether mountaintop wind turbines should be approved. Mm -hmm. And the National Park Service, the custodian of the AT in Maine, fought 
uh, uh, urgently against that, saying it's a scenic trail and the wind turbines will compromise the scenic view. It's not the AT if it's got energy producing turbines alongside of it within view of hikers on the trail. And my students this year were skeptical of that. And they said, you know, there might have been a time when environment was about escape into a seemingly pristine nature. But the way we think about the environment is in terms of clean energy. And they even said that they could imagine enjoying a hike on the AT more if they saw it as a space for making clean energy in a way that 20 years ago, when this controversy erupted in Maine, I don't think you know, most people could identify with. So um, yeah, it is uh, the, 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 the old ways of thinking about this that we're used to um, are fading away in ways that are unpredictable and uncomfortable and, um, you know, um, but nevertheless, a reality that, you know, we're, we're starting to, to learn more about. Fascinating. Um, there's a question here from Carol. She has, uh, what's, what are you planning for your next book? Ay, ay, ay. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure. I, I read that, I read some advice that said, don't be thinking only about your book when it comes out because um, you'll just drive yourself crazy. So be working on your next project. Um, so I've tried to start to maybe think about getting a next project going. Uh, I don't know whether it's really going to be the next project or not. As much as anything, it's been a way to keep my mind off of, you know, when is the New York Times book review going to come out, which is apparently any, if, if it's going to come out, it's going to come out pretty soon. Um, wow. You can imagine that, you know, so I've been trying to keep busy with another project, but I don't know if it's the real thing yet. Um, I teach full time during the academic year. So um, there was no reason that this book had to take as long as it did, except for the fact that I was new at it and didn't really know what I was doing. At the same time, I'm not a full-time writer. And so, you know, I've, I've had to fit these in around my other responsibilities. So my hope is there will be something, um, but it's definitely not gonna be any day soon. Well, let's hope the Times Review comes out soon this week. Yeah, um, I'll look Randy, for that. can you uh, tell us about what you're working on? You, as I said, 80 books and counting. Oh my goodness, yes. And the, the latest things to come out are, are uh, for any of you that know our Birding New England book, we now have Birding Florida and uh, two best easy bird guides for Cape Cod and Acadia National Park. Uh, those, uh, if, uh, if those become popular, then we're going to end up doing uh, best easy bird guides for a lot of other national parks across the country. So we're on our way out, uh, Nick and I are on our way out to the Pacific Northwest in a couple of weeks to do some shooting out there. Uh, of, of bird species that we don't have in our repertoire yet. So uh, it's, uh, it'll be a lot more birds and nature in my life. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful evening. Um, again, the book is The Appalachian Trail, a biography. You can order it online at northshire.com. Let me put the link in the chat one more time. Um, thank you both so very much. This has been fantastic tonight. Oh, th thank you for having us. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. A really, a really enjoyable event. I appreciate everybody turning out for it. Y'all have a good evening and we'll see you at another event soon. Thanks so much.